Hello, welcome. So these are superheroes, okay? Uh, arms bulging, the power of flight, x-ray vision. They're probably on their way to Metropolis or Gotham City or Doomstad, aren't they, to go and save the day. These are what we envisage as being superheroes. But we live, as some of our speakers have talked about today, in the real world. We have real problems that need real people to help fix them. So what about these people, humble geologists? They surely cannot be the heroes we need to fix some of the biggest social and environmental problems we have in the, in the world today. But let's take a moment to look a bit more closely here. So on the left there for you, Anjana Katwa, Dr. Anjana Katwa, an ex-TEDx speaker, in fact. And look what she's holding in her hand. It's a fossil called an ammonite, the type which is found in the rock sequences of the south coast of England, not too far away from here. And it is the birth, life, and death of those fossils, which, as I will tell you later on in the talk, record the changing climatic history of the Earth over several billion years. Dr. Dawn Wright, on your right, standing there with her high-powered laptop, she's not particularly interested in the rocks on land. What she's interested in is the big blue stuff between the planet rocks. She's interested in the oceans. And she's particularly interested in how mapping the oceans can help us identify locations where we might find precious minerals and metals that will help us build batteries, that will help us electrify the world and meet our net zero challenges. And what about me in the middle? Well, more about me later. But to try and kind of conceptualize the importance of these geologists, I need to make you reimagine what a geologist is and convince you they are superheroes. Let's do that through two linked challenges. One is the provision of energy, the very thing that shapes our lives and livelihoods every single day. And linked to that, climate change, the biggest concern we probably have globally at the moment. And why are they linked? It's because it's the burning of fossil fuels and the provision of energy that is driving hazardous climate change. And the work of geologists kind of sits across both of those areas. And I'm going to use those to try and convince you that geologists move amongst you silently all the time, doing their noble work and doing their important work. Fossil fuels are not called fossil fuels for no reason whatsoever. Fossil fuels are called that because they are formed from fossils. They are formed from the remains. Hydrocombs are formed from the remains of dead animals. So the job of a geologist is to look beneath the Earth's surface and try and find those grey layers of rocks. They're what we call source rocks. They're the rocks which, when buried, and all of that organic material decays, give rise to oil and gas. That then flows into the blue layer where the oil and gas accumulates. We also need to buckle those rocks. You can see those rock layers are folded. And that occurs because of plate tectonics. That's because of the slow motions of the Earth's plates over hundreds of millions of years. If that isn't hard enough, that that is all going on in the past, and it's our job as geologists to work that out, this is now all preserved beneath our feet. We can't see it. So how do we do that? We use technology such as this. We fire the white lines down, which are acoustic waves. They're sound waves, in this case from the back of a boat, down into the subsurface of the Earth to try and image it. That's basically similar to having an X-ray of your body when you're feeling poorly. We're sending X-rays in. In this case, they're acoustic waves rather than radio waves. Now, those X-rays are useful, but like when you're ill, an X-ray might be useful. A biopsy might be better, <laughs> actually taking a bit out of you and looking at it. And it's the geologist's job to look at what comes out of that white line descending from the boat, so the rock cores that we actually sampled directly from the Earth. So we're trying to solve the world's hardest puzzle, <laughs> working out what happened tens to hundreds of millions of years ago from indirect evidence that is presently several kilometers beneath our feet. For that alone, we should be celebrated. <laughs> but there's clearly a tension here, isn't there? Because it is those hydrocarbons and the burning of those hydrocarbons that releases this into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, one of the 
most potent greenhouse gases, which is driving anthropogenic climate change. So are we really villains? Should we be hounded down the street for facilitating climate change? Well, there is certainly a discussion to be had about how geological skills have been used in the past and have contributed to climate change. Putting aside my personal viewpoint that it is governments and large industries rather than the actions of individuals we should really be focusing on. That climate change, though, if we, if we want to understand what we're living through now, we need to really understand how bad it is. Is it particularly bad? And the only way we do that is by looking in the past. Many of you will be familiar with this, these colours behind me. They're called warming stripes or climate stripes. Blues are cold, reds are hot. Present day is on your right. About 150, 160 years ago is on your left. So this is post-industrial revolution warming of the planet. To construct that sort of curve is relatively easy. We use fancy thermometers, right? <laughs> so we know very, in a lot of detail what has happened recently. But how do we know that that is unusual? How do we know what that might mean for life on Earth? And we are selfish. We don't really care about the climatic change. We care about how it might affect us in many ways. To do that, we can do a couple of different things. We can use tree rings the science of dendrochronology. We can look at the spacing and thickness of tree rings, and from that, reconstruct the Earth's climate, temperature being one aspect of climate, precipitation being another, but we can reconstruct the climate back to a few tens of thousands of years. For a geologist, that's last Tuesday. <laughs> we can use ice cores recovered from a couple of kilometers at the bottom of kilometer thick ice sheets at the poles. And we can look at the gases contained within those ice cores, which actually provide a record of the prevailing climate when the snow was falling that subsequently got compacted to form that ice. That gives us a record back to about two million years. And for a geologist, that's Christmas, <laughs> just gone. If we really want to get back into the deep time, and we really want to get a handle on how the climate has changed over the 4.7 billion years of Earth history, we actually look at something super tiny. These little things here are called foraminifera. These are animals that live in the present oceans and lived in the Asian oceans. And you can see the size of those only a few hundred microns across, microscopic. It is the chemistry, the composition of the shells of these animals that record the warmth of the ocean in which they lived, and therefore the global climate. And it's our job as geologists to look at the chemistry and, and actually deduce that climatic condition at the time those animals were living. That's the paleontological record, the record of life on Earth. But geologically, where do those fossils come from? They come from layers of rock. And it is the geologist's job to go through layer by layer, extracting these fossils, looking at the chemistry that builds up this, which is the hundred, several hundred million year record of the changing climate on Earth, going back in this case to about 500 million years. You can see where we are present day on the right-hand side, the so-called hockey stick, the little post-industrial upswing you can see on the right-hand side there. That's the warming stripes we looked at earlier. What this tells us is that the Earth's climate, the Earth has been hotter, it's been colder, and it's changed rapidly between those two states. So no geologist will ever tell you that the Earth has always been the same. It has always changed but due to natural drivers, pre-human drivers. What concerns us greatly, though, is that the times of most major climatic change are when we've had what we call mass extinctions. There have been five mass extinctions. Just for reference, one of them was at the end of the Cretaceous, so at about 95 million years, you can see there's a spike. That was when we had the death of the non-flying dinosaurs. And then at about 55 million years, you can see another upswing. That's a time known as the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. That was a time on Earth when the oceans at the, at the equator were as hot as a bathtub. That's how hot the water was. 95% of all marine species died out 
55 million years ago as a function of rapid warming. And in fact, there are only two times in Earth history when the planet has warmed faster than it has today. Once is then at the end of the Cretaceous, and the other time is at the end of the Paleocene. Amazingly, the time at the end of the Cretaceous is when the Earth was hit by a meteorite. And the one at 55 is when the North Atlantic Ocean was born. We are doing the same as what meteorites and plate tectonics can do, just to give you some context for how we are influencing the Earth system. Okay, so geologists can tell us it's a mess. We can tell you it's a big mess. We can tell you we're all going to die because of this big mess. That's not particularly helpful, is it? I'm not inspiring you. I'm not building the case for me being a hero. So what can we do to pull it back? Well, a low-carbon energy future still requires energy provision, educating people, keeping people healthy. All of the things the Millennium Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals are aiming to do require some provision of energy. Offshore wind, capturing those pesky carbon dioxide molecules and, and burying them beneath the earth. Geothermal energy, pumping cold water into the ground and bringing hot water out. These are all climate change mitigation strategies, either directly by carbon capture and storage or indirectly by lowering our carbon intensity around our energy provision. What do you notice about all of those things? What do they all need? They all need people who know about what's going on underneath the Earth's surface. So geologists can reimagine themselves as being not the people solely using their skills to produce hydrocarbons, we can pivot and actually start to contribute to these other things that will help us maintain our lives and livelihoods and keep us safe and empowered, but at the same time envision a better future. So to finish, let's return to our superheroes. Have I made the case that geologists can save the world? <laughs> well, I like to think of geologists as being a bit like Vaccinologists, virologists, immunologists. Over the last three years, they've been everywhere, dictating when we can go to the shops, dictating whether we can go to work. They were here before that. They were silently going about their work, keeping us healthy, keeping us fit, allowing us to do some awful commutes to work. <laughs> but we just didn't know about them until they were thrust into the public consciousness by COVID-19. Now, I'm not going to try and claim geologists are saving lives, but what I will leave you with the idea is that geologists are there. They're powering your laptops. They're powering the lights. They're powering the screen. It's their activities that are doing that. And you all demand it, of course. But there is this big chance to reimagine the role of geologists in the future society and how they can contribute to a just and equitable energy transition. So thank you very much. <laughs>